Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being here with, with us today. I'm Teresa Mosqueda, and I'm thrilled to be here with my council colleague, Councilmember Morales as well, and our community panel, as we have a discussion about how Seattle can grow more equitably, how we can combat displacement and address the legacy of exclusionary zoning. We are so excited about the opportunity to have a discussion rooted in community views and ideas as we look ahead at the comprehensive plan that determines our city's zoning and thus our housing policies. As folks know, this is a long process that actually doesn't end until 2024 for actual comprehensive plan changes. But those policy ideas have to be developed in 2023. And they really should start with community ideas, which will start in 2022. Our conversation here today in 2021 is to set us up for a more inclusionary conversation, a conversation rooted with community ideas and values at the heart, and one that builds off of the racial equity toolkit analysis that we commissioned in 2018 and was just presented in the Land Use Committee in July of 2021. The indications from that racial equity toolkit compelled us to want to act, to bring together this body today of community partners to make sure that we're doing a deep dive analysis of what our, that racial equity toolkit said. And the takeaway was clear that we need a both and approach. We need to both address racial equity and discrimination that is rooted in our exclusionary zoning policies and we must address displacement that has disproportionately affected our communities of color, our lowest wage workers. We can do this both and approach. I am optimistic that with the data in hand and really led by the community voices and the uh, qualitative information that came from robust community conversations, that if we start a conversation today, we can both address exclusionary zoning policies and tackle displacement that has affected our communities of color. That starts, I think, with you all in the community. So Councilmember Morales, I'll turn it over to you for opening comments and save some of my other remarks uh, for later in the discussion. Terrific. Well, thank you so much, Councilmember Morales. Uh, no, that's me, Councilmember Mosqueda. Um, I want to thank the panelists who have joined us today and really thank you to all of the constituents who have joined us and really taking time out of your busy schedules to join this discussion. Your involvement in this work is critical. Um, if we're going to really be able to assess what community is asking for, um, and, and it's important that we hear from our neighbors, this community engagement is really key to developing policy that works not for community, but with community. Um, so I wanna thank Council Member Mosqueda for co-hosting this alongside me today. Um, it's this kind of collaboration um, that allows us as policymakers to really bring forth the best kind of policy for our constituents. It's really important, um, I think, that we both see our offices as a conduit for hearing from your great ideas um, about your great ideas and bringing them into the policymaking arena. Um, my hope for today is that Folks walk away from this discussion with a greater understanding of anti-displacement and community investment ideas, but also that folks are energized to fight for more affordable housing, for our neighbors, um, and for more investments in the kind of workforce development, small business uh, support, and other policies that can really help communities thrive. We know that people in our city deserve a living wage, deserve housing security, deserve a community where they can walk to the doctor, to the pharmacy, to the grocery store, um, and really want and deserve options for how to invest in their sort of hyper-local community. Um, and that's what comprehensive planning can help us do. I think it's important to give context for how Councilmember Mosqueda and I want to frame this discussion. We know that Black and Brown communities have historically been left out of decision-making processes. And we know that historically um, policy decisions have been done to these communities instead of being done with these communities. Um, we know that um, our racist housing policies like redlining and like the urban village strategy really have kept people from building generational wealth. And we know the way in which Seattle has grown in the last decade has also pushed people of color out of our city. Um, 
much faster and to a much greater degree than our white neighbors have been pushed out. We know this. So as we begin to strategize about what our next comprehensive plan looks like, how we right those wrongs, um, racial equity must be front and center in these discussions. The prosperity and preservation of our black and brown communities must be front and center in these conversations. Um, so that's why we really have to look at the comp plan in a very holistic way. It's not just about housing or just about jobs or land use policy. It's all of those things together and they intersect and they affect all of us um, it, you know, in similar ways. If you push one lever, it affects something else. So that's why this whole system, holistic, comprehensive planning process is so important. Um, so I'm really excited about starting this conversation with all of you today. Um, as we've both said, this is the beginning of a years long process, um, but we thought it was really important to start it right by engaging with community, by um, acknowledging that our focus is gonna be on centering racial equity throughout this process and really allowing us to envision together um, just what an equitable comprehensive plan could look like. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask each of our uh, panelists to, to quickly introduce yourselves, and then I'm going to ask, uh, ask Ab to set the stage for us quickly. Yeah, you want to start? You want to unmute, introduce yourself quickly, Maria? Hi everyone, thank you for the invitation to be here. I am Maria Guadalupe Ramirez and I'm the chair of the Duwamish Valley Affordable Housing Coalition. I also have the honor to be working with the Duwamish on the parking lot expansion project, which was funded by the EDI fund as well. And um, we talk about our organization here now, is that what we're doing here? <laughs> and so the Duwamish Valley Affordable Housing Coalition has uh, identified three strategies to address displacement. And I think the one that I'd really like to talk about the most today is preservation. But before I do, I'll say the other two. Uh, one is new affordable housing. And uh, we're really grateful to the city for supporting some new affordable housing that will be coming to South Park in a few years. And then we also have an initiative for a multi-purpose building, a uh, public space for opportunities uh, to learn, uh, economic development, um, just bringing the community together, perhaps housing the food bank, the senior center, uh, the Duwamish. And so we're really excited about that project. But today I want to say, um, I, recently I was talking to someone about preservation and I don't think we were like talking about the same thing. So I thought I'd say what I see preservation as. And um, what I see preservation as is, you know, I work with the Latino community and in South Park area, I'm always amazed at how long folks have lived in their apartments, like 15, 20, 30 years. And right now they're so fearful that their buildings will be sold. And so for me, preservation is how can we find a new way to have resident owned communities where they can preserve their housing, create an affordable house opportunity for home ownership and uh, it's permanently affordable. And so that to me is preservation, preserve what housing is already here, it's green. And for me, it uh, makes sense. So that's what I wanna talk about most today. Thank you so much. That's terrific, thank you. <clears throat> Curtis, you wanna go next? Sure, hi, I'm, I'm Curtis Brown with the Brighton Development Group. We just... Oh dear, Curtis, I think we just lost you. You're in the South End, so I know that's what happens. Let's, let's try I, that again. Uh, I'm lost. We just got you back. You froze for a okay. moment. Okay. okay. I'm not, not sure how I got lost. Uh, I just upgraded my internet. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm Curtis Brown. I'm with the Brighton Development on the corner of Holly and Rainier. We have about five acres of land that we're developing and, and, and adding housing there. Uh, I've, I grew up in 
to walk to, to, to meeting in, in the Madison Valley when you shouldn't walk in the valley. Uh, then I went to Garfield and then I, then I lived south here in, in, uh, in, in, in Hillman City, then Columbia City. So I've actually got to watch displacement happen specifically um, over almost 50 years. Uh, so it's a, it, it's a real passion. I, I, I watched it happen. Currently, uh, we're working on our anti and, and displacement plan is to develop a, a hundred million dollar capital stack. So we're working with with banks, foundations, the city, uh, um, entrepreneurs, and we're de we're developing a stack of capital that 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 everybody can access to purchase as much property as possible to fight back displacement. Our goal is actually to reverse the the demographic chain changes that are occurring in in the Brighton neighborhood. Um, and again, we just switched our name to the Brighton Development Group because we're actually working with seven or eight for-profit entrepreneurs that are black that are actually doing anti-displacement work. And so we wanted to be able to use our nonprofit to not only do our work, but, but to also facilitate black own ownership and black entrepreneurship in their process of increasing community wealth. So it's really exciting to, to see that we already have a, a Black entrepreneur that is, is developing ownership teams among African Americans in, in Southeast Seattle. And our goal is, is, is really stepping back as a nonprofit, but facilitating those through the capital stack to make sure that they can access the capital they, they need to change. That's great. Thank you, Curtis. We lost you again for just a second. I find sometimes that if I turn off my camera, uh, it helps me, although I know that's a challenge here. Um, Andrea, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you today. I'm Andrea Ray, and I'm the President and CEO of the Seattle Southside Chamber of Commerce. And as a regional chamber, our focus is absolutely on economic development, education and workforce development and support for our local businesses and community members. Housing, of course, is a crucial key component for economic development. Uh, we all know we need more housing, all housing types, uh, but we also know that displacement doesn't just impact residents. It also impacts our small neighborhood shops and businesses as well. Businesses serve as key community hubs and lend themselves to the fabric and vibrancy of the neighborhood. Much of our work with commercial affordability, housing and anti-displacement strategies centers the needs of our community, first helping to work directly with the businesses and of course advocate for policies that create more opportunity and less hardship within our economic ecosystem. And that means we're thinking creatively about finding solutions to these challenges, uh, things like land trusts, uh, public private partnerships. It's great to hear Curtis talk about some of the things that he's doing. Um, these are all great examples of, of solutions that we've seen work effectively within our community. And we hope to continue to see and support more community led creative solutions to help guard against displacement and create more economic equity. And that's why we're here and we're so happy to help support and continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And Ab, let's go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you, council member. Uh, I am Ab, I'm a community planner, policy analyst and community organizer. Uh, I'm a program manager at Puget Sound Sage in our just transition infrastructure program. Um, at SAGE, we chart a path to a living economy by developing community power to influence, lead, and govern. And we work at the intersections of racial justice and economic justice to advance climate justice, equitable development of land and transportation, and worker rights through community-based participatory research coalition organizing, policy advocacy, and leadership development. Uh, at SAGE, we envision a living economy where BIPOC workers, families, and communities thrive, and where we live in a sustainable relationship uh, with our land. And our work on displacement has been focused on community stewardship of land as a solution. 
Uh, we've been organizing a Seattle BIPOC community organizations to uh, create opportunities for community control of land uh, and homes to prevent displacement, uh, preserve affordability and create resilient communities. Uh, we do that through our advocacy around equitable development initiative, uh, Green New Deal, um, and in our Just Transition Infrastructure Program, we focus on building the new, where we can put in place the policy and resources we need to achieve collective uh, ownership of land and housing. And we see this in the context of the public health crisis that we're in. Um, as we think about equitable recovery and uh, community resiliency, uh, we need to think about that in our city's growth. And for us, that looks like making deep investments uh, in the self-determination of uh, BIPOC communities and in supporting community-driven solutions to addressing um, institutional harms of displacement and dispossessions that um, were exacerbated by the pandemic. Great, thank you. Um, well, Ab, I'm gonna ask you to stay with us for a couple more minutes. Um, so I know that Puget Sound Sage provided um, capacity building through the racial equity, um, the community engagement process with your Comp Plan 101 training. Um, and through that, you were able to connect with community stakeholders, particularly those who have been impacted by structural and institutional discrimination on, and, and racism um, when it comes to planning issues. So given this work, um, we wanted to ask you to help ground us, ground this conversation um, in the kinds of things that you, that you heard through these trainings. So um, I'm gonna ask you a couple questions. Um, how can we ground this discussion, um, particularly about the comp plan, um, in ways that are more accessible and inclusive for folks, um, particularly those who are impacted and who want to engage throughout the next couple years in the process. Um, and so maybe, you know, if somebody is just moving to Seattle today, I will ask, um, what would you tell them about what they need to know to understand planning in Seattle? Thank you for those questions. Um, we know that a comprehensive plan is a guiding document that articulates how a place and its community will grow in the future. Um, and planning happens at different levels of government, uh, but it's often led by uh, planning practitioners. Uh, historically, the city's comprehensive planning is something that is done to our communities um, with little participation um, from our people. And so as we think about combating displacement and addressing the legacy of exclusionary zoning, we need to center equity in our community engagement um, in planning for how our city grows. Like we should be truly clear on what is at stake in a comprehensive plan. Um, if our communities are not leading the planning, someone else is doing it for them. And so we cannot underplay the impacts of a comprehensive plan. It's not an easy process. It should not be rushed. Uh, ultimately, this is about the health and welfare of our city and communities. Uh, simply holding large gatherings and expecting conversations by bringing together diverse groups will not be enough. Um, as we think about land ownership, uh, economic disparity, uh, language barriers that create uh, power differentials at these uh, gatherings um, that never really results in the needs of BIPOC communities being met. Um, so people need to be engaged in their own context and supported through a community-led planning process, which doesn't have to be too long or too drawn out, but has to be real and without uh, recreating the power asymmetry that is already in place. And so community-led uh, community planning is a participatory process that ensures there is meaningful community engagement uh, in the development of a community plan or in this concept or this context or a comprehensive plan. Um, it's an alternative to um, how traditional planning only asks for input instead of 
um, really engaging um, throughout the entire planning process. And so we believe in the capacity of our communities to lead an engagement inquiry um, by building their capacity through these uh, trainings and leadership development opportunities. And these new opportunities for our community um, partners, um, we see that as a way to empower and really lift up the already existing uh, assets in the communities and how we can um, build up and leverage the city's resources to uh, further a community vision that is already in place. Well, thank you very much Ab, for that summary. And thank you, Councilmember Morales, for introducing our esteemed panelists here today. Thank you, community, uh, for being here, not only with us today, but as we help set the course for righting these historic wrongs, for making sure that our footprint of the city stops shrinking where we can develop affordable housing and inclusive housing, and instead actually lives up to its commitment to being an inclusive and welcoming city. So thank you very much. Ab um, provided a summary of you know, how to orient ourselves to uh, why this issue is so important. And I think that that is so critical as I've had a few people ask me recently, well, why does this matter? There's so many people who have moved here in the last three to five years. So that level setting is important. Ab, I wanna thank you and Puget Sound Sage as well for doing that type of orientation at the community focused roundtables that accompanied the racial equity toolkit. Uh, my understanding is Puget Sound Sage helped to orient folks at the beginning of these community meetings about what was at stake and why we were doing this process that Ab just outlined and really rooted those conversations in what the comprehensive plan did. Um, and I think very briefly, just to uh, ground us as well in terms of what the report showed, the report that came out of those conversations that Ab and others at Puget Sound Sage and community participated in showed that it was clear that BIPOC communities and our communities um, who are lowest wage workers and most vulnerable were at the most risk if we didn't change the status quo. Participants said, according to the Racial Equity Toolkit, that the BIPOC communities have suffered the most from insufficient housing supply, from lack of choice and lack of affordability. The urban village strategy they concluded from these community roundtable discussions were seen by many as perpetuating a historical pattern of exclusionary zoning and it should be examined and revised to, more, to be more racially equitable and inclusive in the next plan update. It concluded that changing single family zoning to allow for more housing types could benefit BIPOC communities by reducing market and displacement pressures, by increasing access to high opportunity neighborhoods and amenities and creating more options for home ownership. And participants observed that under the current urban village strategy that Ab just outlined and explained um, in these community roundtables, that displacement and actual and threatened displacement had severely impacted BIPOC communities, household businesses, and nonprofits. That cultural anchors were also impacted by displacement pressure. All of that speaks to what Councilmember Morales talked about, which is creating a, self, a sense of place and making sure that we're looking at economic opportunities as well as housing opportunities, cultural ways that we can thrive as well as make sure that we have the housing to survive. And some of the participants in these forums cited the contributing factor of the exclusionary policies and displacement is the fact that they were shut out of neighborhoods and confined to areas that are now targeted for development and that we must look towards the plan for both an anti-displacement strategy and creating a growth strategy that emphasizes a range of tools, including creating more affordable housing, community preference, and creating household and community well-being. So with that recommendation in mind, with the ground setting that Ab just provided for us, we have a set of questions that we will ask and colleagues, we are gonna have this little timer here just to try to keep us on time, but the blue screen will appear when we're hoping that you'll wrap it up. And this is not intended to be disrespectful because you have so much important things to share, but to help us get through this conversation so that we can also field a few community questions that we know will come in. The first question, um, and we're gonna go through each of the panelists. If you wanna try to provide your feedback in two minutes, that would be great. And we will make sure that everybody gets a chance to rotate through, starting with Maria, then we'll go to Ab, then Curtis and Andrea. 
The first question is the racial equity toolkit calls for policies that increase housing and neighborhood choice to create more accessible, plentiful and diverse housing opportunities across our city. And it states the city must end the prevalence of single family zoning quote with a quote, racially inclusive approach, end quote. What does it mean to have a racially inclusive approach to zoning? And how can the city create more housing choices for our communities while centering BIPOC communities most impacted by these historic wrongs when we think about enacting that racially inclusive zoning approach? Again, we'll start with Maria. Okay, thank you. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, the, that's a big question. And for me, I was gonna focus in some areas because I'm actually not sure if the comprehensive plan focuses on zoning, land, land, lending, and land use, if that's where you, we already know that the city can influence most. So I'm gonna talk about those areas. Um, for me, you know, um, you're already doing, the city's doing it. They're centering the BIPOC community the way their approach has been with SAGE. Uh, and so I'm really encouraged to see that because you really need to connect the people with the problem and have them talk about it and think about it. And so um, for zoning, uh, I guess, you know, we, we have to also focus on the first wrong, which is that we're on stolen land. This is the land of the Coast Salish people, the Duwamish called the river their home. That's where they came from. And so I think the first wrongs were in zoning probably were from the beginning. And so it's not just what happened after folks decided they wanted to be, have exclusive communities or exclude people. So I think the zoning is just knowing how we're gonna do that. And, um, and so then lending, uh, I know a lot of people I encounter the whole I-10, not being able to get a loan to buy a home. And how can we make lending more fair and not having this be in a feeding frenzy and that uh, people are going to as an option, uh, you know, because there's few options, they'll go to banks with higher interest because they'll take the I-10. So I think protection of, of consumers and then financial education. Folks really don't know what it means to run up a credit card, how they're gonna pay it back. How do we inform the community to make better choices in how they manage the money they do have? And so those are just a few of the ideas that came to my head. Thanks. Fantastic. I love the, the lending component as well. Next is Ab. Um, thank you. I think, yeah, as you know, we think about access um, and what racially inclusive approach to zoning would look like, um, we must also like reverse the ex exclusion from the finance tools and uh, subsidies by the government, um, you know, building denser housing won't help if um, BIPOC households can't get financing or the subsidies they need to make this purchase or um, rent. And, you know, you could imagine a Seattle where multifamily developments sprout up in single family zone areas, but are still so expensive that existing BIPOC communities are not able to afford them. Um, so we could look for our zoning tools. Um, I heard earlier someone mentioned about um, how a community land trust um, can help mitigate displacement um, because we can imagine single family zoning um, areas being zoned for denser development that will create um, housing development is stewarded by community land trust and ensure that um, the transitions from um, non-single family zoning, it's centered on these um, low access uh, households. Thank you very much. Uh, next will be Curtis. And Curtis, you're coming through looking good right now. So we'll let you know okay. if we can't hear you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, um, I just will, Quickly, I, I think what what I like to do is is just talk about we're you know what we're working on are innovative ideas like small tiny houses. 
uh, rethinking our zoning. So it would be great to have something as simple as where a number of council members and some of us who are working on innovative projects met monthly and, and, and were able to have a working group to work on those. You know, example is, is we were working on a tiny house project and uh, we had someone from land, land use and we were asking about sewer connections. Well, that's very expensive. And uh, we asked the land, well, is there any flexibility? And I started asking, is there any, how did you come to that in, in decision? And they said, well, and that was the answer. Well, and it's, it's, just, it's the realization that there's a lot of power down in, in, in that office. And to, to have your team working with our teams on these type of issues. And so we can fast track zoning issues. We can fast track some, some of the innovations so we can test and try new ideas because we're running out of time. So speed is of the essence. Any changes we make has to be speed related. Every day lost is two or three families lost. So, so that's all I wanna say on that. It's a great idea. Thank you. And Andrea. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's great going last because I can just say everything Curtis and Ab and Maria said. Uh, I think, again, it starts with what you said earlier, uh, Councilmember Mosqueda, in your opening remarks, um, that this is a both and conversation, and it starts first with community. And I think that that's truly how so many of these complex problems um, are solved, is being inclusive with our solution finding. Again, you know, App discussed how important it is to provide that alternative to how traditional planning works. Again, just kind of flipping the script and instead of saying, hey, here's the plan, you know, give us your input. We're saying, we think we need a plan. What do you suggest, right? And really engaging the community, um, you know, first and empowering the community, um, you know, to be able to participate in the process and giving the community the tools to be able to do that. Um, as mentioned, the power dynamics um, are different um, and, and we need to shift those up so that, that there's trust and there's comfort within that process. Um, and again, the financial literacy piece, like Maria mentioned, um, how important it is to train the trainer. Um, there are programs available. There are things that are working, um, but the lack of those programs working and working well often is just by not connecting the people that need those programs the most um, to being able to utilize those programs. So community navigator, um, you know, programs. Um, the idea, like Curtis said, of creating a cohort, you know, can, can we meet quarterly and talk about this? Hey, this worked in my project, but this didn't work. Okay, well, I'm gonna take that and apply that to my project. The more we can build in that um, collaboration, uh, the more we can build in the efficiencies, and then the, the more work we're able to get done, we're able to get done together. Thank you. I've taken a lot of notes on even just this first question. So thank you so much. I'll turn it over to you, Councilman Morales. Thank you. Um, I love what you're saying, Andrea, about um, and Curtis about you know allowing these cohorts to come together to learn from one another, to troubleshoot together, and really increase everyone's capacity to understand how you do these projects well um, by learning from from your neighbors. Um, so. We're obviously um, sort of reacting, uh, responding to the racial equity analysis report that recently came out of um, OPCD. Um, and one of the things that the report uh, recommends is increasing the supply of affordable housing, particularly units that are community controlled, um, to ensure kind of long-term affordability, um, and also to consider developing a fund to support acquisition of units that are um, whose affordability is expiring um, and, and able to use those units for community land trusts, for cooperative home ownership models, um, along with other affordable home ownership opportunities, um, and particularly in neighborhoods that are currently zoned for single family. Um, so you've all mentioned a few ideas in general that the city could be doing, but I wonder if you could talk about uh, the role that the city could play in creating, really creating community controlled housing, community ownership models that are, that are affordable, um, ownership models that are affordable to low and middle income families, particularly as we're trying to combat decades of 
um, you know, historic redlining and, and, and the displacement that we've seen. Um, maybe I will ask, uh, maybe we'll go in the same order. Uh, Maria Guadalupe, if you wanna go first. And again, if, if, uh, if y'all wanna, uh, don't wanna answer this particular question or any of these questions and feel like you just wanna pass, that's also just fine. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, well, we've been struggling with this uh, idea of community ownership in the coalition since we formed. And when we first started out, we were told we couldn't create our own land trust. And then now it sounds like we are, because folks are. And so for me, um, we need more understanding of what it takes to create a land trust and if that's really about the question, the question, let me see, it's uh, loaded because there's a lot in here. Um, creating community control housing. Uh, well, it's about the acquisition of those expiring units. So that seems to be the biggest opportunity right now that we're seeing. And so it's, uh, again, it's about connecting the people to this and looking at the is it's not a problem, but you look at it and you have to analyze it and tear it apart. And I love the idea of a fund to support the acquisition of expiring units. I mean, it's, that's preservation. And so I've been asking for a revolving fund for preservation so that folks, because the first barrier to all of this is getting the land, the site control. And so that's already, if there's already property that's under some agreement right now and it could be moved over then fantastic because the biggest hurdle is you know a bunch of folks find out their buildings going for sale how are they going to compete in the market to buy it how are they going to come together with the pro forma and the lending they don't know what they don't know and we know that and so how can we make it possible in different scenarios to help folks come together and do this because it's a vision i see it in legislation but I, I don't know if anyone's actually pulled it off yet here in Seattle. So that's my only thing. Thanks. Thank you. Chris, um, you've probably thought about that particular challenge quite a bit. What are you, what are your thoughts? You're muted. Well, as you know, I, I 24 seven on, on, on this. Um, our, our issue is 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 access to capital, and I could talk on again. All of our work is around developing this hundred million dollar capital stack. So not only our nonprofit, but our entrepreneurs in the neighborhood. And so we're working with all these different groups of the stack to make sure that everyone knows how to get the capital they need. However, the question I think is in the, in in the context of of the of the city. What, what I really like the city to look at is where are they are parking all their money and investments. And I think one of the issues that uh, hasn't been talked about much is there are hundreds of million dollars coming in and then it's going right back out, but there is that interim cash flow. And one of the issues that we all deal with is liquidity. So it, it, one of the issues I think that we could really look at is how we can access those dollars on short term for short term property acquisition until we can get our interim financing and then our, 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 our uh, permanent financing in, in place. So I think we should really look at how cities investing this money and, and how we can do that. Then what we can do with the banks is that money then could be seen as guarantees to the banks. So we could really leverage the money that's coming in in a way that's kind of a big time process. I and and I think I think the other part that I'd just quickly like to say I would like to see the, the city require all nonprofits to have a crowdfunding aspect to all of their affordable housing and make home. I mean, property ownership, part of a, a part of doing business in Seattle, the, the, the community who has been kept out of ownership needs to be a priority of making sure that they own. So I would make crowdfunding a key part of all projects. Nice. Okay, very good. Um, Andrea. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, I, I think similar, right? I mean, it, it does come down, you know, to the money and it comes down, you know, to the resources. And so the city does have 
um, a unique leadership position, you know, within this, this framework and this model, because the city can be the primary convener uh, and the, you know, primary instigator for helping to, you know, share re um, resources and, and leverage those resources for the benefit of the project, right? So um, we can kind of go out of this, um, you know, the traditional landscape of, you know, either it's a land trust or, you know, it's uh, MFTE or, you know, it's uh, development agreements that reduce um, different impact fees, et cetera, et cetera. But again, we go back to the, um, you know, yes and, right? You know, how can we create more liquidity? How can we have the city serve in that leadership role, especially as it relates, you know, to finance, financing and land acquisition? Um, so that these projects can pencil, pencil more quickly and include um, more of the, the equity and the ownership piece so we can really start to create more of the, the generational wealth um, that we know home ownership is, is so key um, to, to that generational wealth and to breaking the cycles of, of poverty within our community. Great, thank you so much. Ab? Uh, I think I'll just add that, you know, like the, as I mentioned around the context of being in a pandemic, um, the city has the resources to remove land and housing from the speculative market, especially those with expiring affordability subsidies. Uh, these acquisition and preservation funds are critical. Um, and investing in infrastructures that enable these cooperative models of ownership, whether that's in the form of real estate cooperatives or uh, funding land trust incubators, but ensuring that there is a program that provides technical assistance um, to really build the capacity of um, community organizations to um, not just engage, but actually lead the process. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what we're here to talk about, right? Is how do we build capacity within communities so that these can be led by community, not just in terms of coming up with the ideas, but in sharing power, access to power and access to resources so that these community led projects can be community driven projects as well. Um, thank you all for that uh, really um, insightful information. Council Member Mosqueda, I will pass it back to you. Thank you so much. I am on page two of note taking. So this is uh, very exciting. And it's also reaffirming, right? You Many people have been saying this for a number of years. So we're all packaging it together um, in terms of talking about the menu of policy ideas. So question number three, and I'm going to drop it into the chat as well so folks can see that. Um, we uh, are talking a lot about the fact that this um, racial equity toolkit and the Office of Planning Commission's uh, report that was shared in Council Member Strauss's Committee on Land Use. And just for a quick second, I want to Thank Councilmember Strauss. He's been a huge champion of this conversation as well. He couldn't join us today, but um, has been at the forefront of also making sure that the conversation is present in his committee. So I want to thank him and his team. But the reality from that presentation, as we looked at sort of analyzing the growth strategy, it was a growth strategy centered on a plan that came together in 1994, when the population was 500,000 people. And flash forward to today, we've seen the population grow by over 50% of that number. We're at over uh, about 780,000 people in the city of Seattle. And that strategy from 94 is supposed to be determining how we have job growth, how we have housing that's built, how we support our businesses. And it's supposed to be centering community and equity and racial inclusion in the policy. But I think the reality was that this strategy um, of an urban village plan um, it, that was purported to have racial equity and sustainability at the forefront, the reality is what we've seen over the last 40 years is that the housing affordability crisis has worsened, displacement crisis has worsened, homelessness has continued to increase, which is a direct result from the lack of affordable housing and the legacy of discriminatory policies. So our, I think with that sort of historical grounding on when this policy document was created and how it's supposed to inform our very different landscape today, what would a truly equitable and sustainable climate resilient 
growth system look like? What are some of the pillars that you would like to see around equity and sustainability and climate resilience when we think about building the next um, growth plan? Oh, excuse me. And why don't we shake it up? Um, I'll start with Ab first and then we'll go to Curtis and then we'll go to Andrea and Maria. So Ab, do you wanna get us started? Um, communities already have a vision for how they want their neighborhood to grow and it should not have to take decades before a neighborhood plan is taken action on. Um, you know, the city should be directing resources to support these community-led solutions that grow the capacity of neighborhoods to be resilient. Um, Take, for example, the Grand Street Equitable Transit Oriented Development. It is a community driven vision for the future uh, in preparation for the light rail. Uh, we need to make sure that the city is reflecting this effort and its plan for growth. Um, there are many communities uh, like the Grand Street neighborhood, uh, especially in the South, um, that are doing the groundwork um, in organizing their communities to uh, learn about community real estate, to um, learn about uh, energy uh, justice work, uh, energy efficient infrastructure. Um, and so the city already has existing resources. We need to keep investing in those. Equitable Development Initiative um, is a resource in Seattle that has uh, moved a lot of the community driven mission um, in the city and supporting programs like Green New Deal that addresses um, climate and uh, the future of job growth in the city. Like we have the policies in place and we just need to continue building on those and leveraging existing resources. Thank you so very much. Um, we'll go to Curtis next. I'm going to pass for the most part, but I, I, I do want to say on just on the sustainability piece, uh, having lived in Seattle my whole life, uh, I, I'm concerned of my work that sometimes green might blunt black. And so we have people that are down in the city that are very green focused, but live in these white communities. And sometimes they don't think about cost and, 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 and different things. I think it's really important that there's an understanding of the impact of, of some of the sustainability when we use that word, especially in an environmental context, that we're not creating solutions that increase displacement. And that's just a genuine concern that I have. So green should not blunt black. And so that's just how I, I just, you know, just, I just wanted to say that. Okay, interesting. That might uh, prompt some more questions later. So thank you for um, sharing that. And I uh, would love to talk more about how we expedite green building as well um, for folks who are trying to create this more sustainable housing as well. Andrea, um, do you want to take us off on an, uh, your ideas on this question? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll just say that there will always be discussions surrounding what constitutes success, right? You know, I'm sure the dis those discussions happened in 1994, right? Here we are in 2021. We'll be here again in 2041, right? Um, however, what remains constant is that focusing and centering community to lead and define what success looks like, you know, really is that that key component. And again, you know, wealth disparity has also not decreased, you know, since 1994. We've definitely seen, you know, that that wealth gap, you know, gap continue to increase. And of course, that impacts housing with lower skilled and underemployed workers living further away from employment centers and spending time commuting that they could be spending on learning new skills. And it all contributes to a cycle of, of poverty that we see played out in our community um, with families working multiple minimum wage jobs just to keep a roof over their head and food on the table. Seattle is an expensive place to live. And so I go back to, again, what are we doing to increase housing? Yes, so that workers can live closer to their jobs. Yes. And how are we investing in education and workforce programs? Are we communicating with our young people 
that a career in the trades is a, a lifestyle where you can provide for your family um, and you know end those cycles of, of poverty. So those are those are a couple of of my key thoughts and takeaways. Excellent, thank you. And Maria, hello everybody. Well, I thought I'd take my affordable housing hat off and put my education advocate hat on because for me, a vision, true equity, sustainability, climate resistance, we have to have folks who've gone through school and are educated and can make, uh, can vote uh, in, uh, you know, based on what they understand and not what they're told. And I think it's a big, you know, like what I noticed from most urban villages is they don't draw on the school. Schools are so important. They're part of the community. They're what make up, they're the infrastructure for young families. That's how they connect. And we're missing so much of human capacity by not engaging the parents more, the families, the kids more into civic engagement. It's an old fashioned idea of the civic engagement. I feel like it is. I mean, I went to my first volunteered at my first election when I was 15, you know, it was in my neighborhood and I went there. And so, you know, it's just part of what we need to, we need to all visualize what we need to harness this human capacity that we have that we're missing out. And we've got folks here who speak so many different languages and yet they come here to learn English. And we, we need to appreciate bilingualism and multilingualism and all the culture that comes with them. It's so interesting now. In the old days, it was a melting pot. And then it became like this tossed salad. And I don't know what it is now. Uh, you know, we're each having our own stew. And so we got to figure out how we're going to maintain who we are, really understand who we are, to feel comfortable knowing where I am, who, why do I look the way I do, where do I come from, why am I here, and understand others. And I think it's just basically all founded in a good education. And that's a huge job. And I don't know what the city sees their role as in improving the outcomes of Seattle public schools, but you know, I sure hope that there's something in the plan that could help that. Thank you. I love all of these answers. And I think that it also gets to the intersectionality of the need for us to harness the energy and the expertise within community that you all are displaying today and look through that intersectional lens at how we address the crisis of lack of housing supply, lack of affordable housing, and the ways in which we're creating a sense of place um, to make it more than just a roof and a door, uh, which we you know, absolutely need for folks, but then it needs to be so much more. So I love all those answers and the ways that they intersect as well. Councilman Morales, I'll turn it to you for our last set of questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, well, I love the focus on education um, and I really also love what you were saying, Andrea, about um, our need to also consider workforce development, right? So um, part of what the, the um, equity report indicated um, was that we also need to foster a more equitable workforce development system. Um, I sit on the um, uh, Economic Development District Board of the PSRC, and they recently commissioned a report on, on what, a, what an equitable economy looks like, what we need to do to really move in that direction. And what we know is that the data pre-COVID was alarming, but not surprising, um, that the Seattle area ranks in the bottom third large metropolitan areas for Black and Hispanic representation in tech jobs in, and in management roles. And only 8% of high growth firms in the city are owned by people of color, um, despite the fact that they represent 35% of the workforce. So I'm really interested in thinking about um, not just housing and land use policy, not just land use policy as it relates to housing, but um, what it means for uh, you know, preserving uh, affordable commercial space, supporting small businesses. So can you all talk about the strategies, um, the strategies that you might recommend be included in the comp plan so that we can center access to high growth workforce opportunities, to progressive wealth building opportunities, um, and uh, for, um, you know, 
kind of thriving commercial corridors, as well as long-term affordable housing for folks who have been, uh, who are in neighborhoods, communities that have historically been excluded. Um, let's see, I'm going to, uh, Andrea, I'll start with you and then um, ask Ab to go next. Perfect, thank you so much, council member. Uh, again, I think we're on, as a chamber, on that forefront of providing that technical assistance to so many businesses. Uh, and the pandemic just really showed us the disparities in our community. And one of those greatest disparities, and I think a place where the city could, could hopefully really lean in and you know, leverage some support is with digital literacy. Um, digital literacy, access to internet, broadband, we saw very quickly how you know, businesses and community members that did not have uh, digital uh, literacy skills or access to the internet were immediately you know, so far behind um, you know, others you know, who did have that. Um, another key element would be the support services, um, you know, services such as, you know, child care and again, the expansion of apprenticeship programs so that workers can earn while they learn, investing in that technical assistance and the community navigator program so that we can prioritize the access to get to the people that really need it that that really should be um, front and center. Um, so th again, the idea of investing in, in digital uh, literacy, digital upskilling, um, supporting that more, uh, more agile workplaces uh, so that more businesses um, are able to take on you know, younger apprentice apprentices, uh, internship programs, a comprehensive approach um, to retraining, expanding apprenticeship programs, I think that that really that really is is huge. I'll save my um, suggestion for year-round school, maybe maybe for for another panel another time. Um, but it, we we need more access um, and and we we need more support. Thank you. Um, well, as the mother of two kids in public school, I fully support year-round school. <laughs> Maybe for different reasons, but anyway, uh, Maria Guadalupe, please. Go ahead. Me? I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. I thought it was Ab. Um, for me, I was just going to talk more recently about my lose. experience. With... Um, did you lose me? There we go. Am I here? Go. Please go ahead. Yeah. All right. Um, I was going to talk about my experience with the maritime and industrial work that I did. I can't remember the formal name of the group, but we looked at the Ballard areas and Soto, South Park, Georgetown areas. And those areas are just, talk about low-hanging fruit. I mean, there's space there that we need to make affordable for folks or make it safe for the industry that's there still to continue doing what they do in a safe, clean way. And I thought, it, uh, maybe I'm bringing in other subjects, but they didn't really want to consider affordable housing in that area. And so we sort of like, uh, they wanted to put a little placeholder there and say, let's talk about that next time. And so there wasn't a lot of support for people who work in the industrial area to have affordable housing there. But um, I think talk about sustainability and green, you know, shorter commutes to your work, uh, have, and not, not just commuting by car, but having the bus transportation and walking and bikes, uh, bike trails to get to work. And so um, I'm just gonna look at my notes real quick. Um, that's really where, I, that's all about uh, progressive wealth building to me means long-term community ownership of land. And so I think you're addressing that with the community land trust and long-term affordable housing. I think it's putting it where it's needed and have a variety of AMI of, uh, Annual, annual area of median income so that it's more a mix and not so exclusive as it has been. And um, I think, again, turning back to the original people who lived here and the, um, the use of land and the land that they lost, acknowledging that and how we're going to make that right, if that's what the city wants to do, if that's what the community agrees to, if we're going to look at historically... Uh, excluded people, we have to start there and then look at the BIPOC communities, you know, the black communities and the immigrant communities that come in after them. So it's a huge job. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the conversation. I know it's just a start. So I hope that helps them. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. 
Um, Ab, why don't we have you go next and Curtis can bring us home with that one. Thanks. Um, I'll just speak on uh, what Maria has also brought up about community ownership of land. Um, we really need to build uh, the power of BIPOC communities to self-determine, uh, increase their autonomy by establishing policies or increasing uh, resources that the city already has uh, to ensure that uh, community organizations have the capacity to uh, support residents in their neighborhoods. Um, and I think that legitimizing um, these community efforts um, as within the context of comprehensive planning is also um, critical. You know, we need to prioritize uh, community-led planning, um, centering these impacted uh, stakeholders. And I, I think of one example as such as the like International Special Review District, uh, where, bo where Board of Community Stakeholders are able to um, review development projects. Um, we feel that um, communities need more of like a community planning board to be able to hold uh, the city um, and developers accountable um, and how we um, build our city up. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Curtis. Okay, well, I'm gonna stick with progressive wealth building since that's, that's my piece. Um, I would really like the, the city to really start working on the idea of us having our own crowdfunding portal. I know you're looking at community investment trust, but I think a crowdfunding portal versus that would be A, we get up immediately, B, it would increase, it would increase the number of entrepreneurs in the neighborhood, probably 10, 20 fold. It would, it would allow them to come together in, in groups and raise capital in a very simple legal way, which otherwise they're confined by all the issues of LLCs and, and just all the stuff that we're, that, that we're working through. Uh, we definitely would like to work with this on changing some of the state laws that currently make it difficultly for uh, nonprofits to issue securities to community members so they can actually be part owners. We have some of the most restrictive laws of uh, security laws in the country, which prohibits us from raising capital. Um, I really like us to also look at how we might, how the city gives a, the, the granting process. Everything is high stakes on a certain couple of dates a year. And what that does is it keeps us from really creating real coalitions and coming up with ideas and getting ongoing continuous funding versus I got to put together a $75,000 grant. It'd be great to be able to come for a five to 10, have, you know, here's our first part and developing these relationships and developing capacity as we need it, not on a high stakes half a million dollar or half stake $50,000 grant. I really like to think of it as, as continuous in investments and more of a partnership with, with, with the city instead of doling out money. Um, and ultimately, I think I have the, the, the city help encourage nonprofits to see themselves as facilitators of entrepreneurs and, entre and ownership in communities versus problem solvers. I think our nonprofits spend too much time solving problems, not looking for the entrepreneurs in the community and facilitating them to change our, 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 our communities. That's great, Curtis. Thank you so much. As somebody who uh, was a grant maker and worked in nonprofits for a long time, the how we structure our granting process is really troublesome. Um, and I agree, we really need to be thinking about um, you know longer term, more sustained funding rather than sort of very frequent one-off funding that doesn't allow our community organizations um, to plan in any kind of sustainable way for the kinds of programs that we are hoping they fund uh, or, or set up to serve community best. So really important points there. Um, so we are going to move now um, to audience questions. We do have a few audience questions. Um, we also have uh, some reporters who are on the line. Um, so we're hoping that we have some time to get to some of those questions as well. Um, but first, I'm going to start by asking one question. Um, and I don't have the name of the person, so I'll just read the question. 
Um, my question is about the role of a public bank to address some of the more creative anti-displacement options that are more common in other cities or other parts of the world. For example, cooperative models. Is this something any of you are aware of and are advocating for? And are there plans to include public banking discussions or current Seattle area lenders in that process? Um, I will ask our um, panelists if any of you have something that you want to um, chime in on here. I, I, I've been, uh, is it represent, Senator Bob Hasegawa has been uh, talking about a public bank for quite a few years. I started going to the meetings early on and there was a promise that there'd be money there for affordable housing. And I think it's a great idea why are we letting putting all this money, sending it to banks instead it could be recirculated within the economy of the public sector. And so I'm all for it. Yes, yes, the public bank is needed. Thank you. I saw a lot of heads nod on that answer. Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, okay, did you wanna chime in on this? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that um, public bank deters like profiteering that we would normally experience with Wall Street bank banks. Um, public bank gives an opportunity to have mission-driven uh, financing institutions um, within neighborhoods. Great, thank you. And I'll just say, I did see this morning some video, uh, apparently AOC is also talking now about some federal legislation to help support this, the uh, local and statewide efforts um, across some parts of the country anyway, to start moving in that direction. So that'll be an interesting conversation to watch. Um, Council Member Mosqueda, I will hand it off to you. Great, thanks so much. And yeah, for folks um, who are interested in chiming in on the answers, feel free to jump in. And if you want, don't really wanna um, go into the question, that's no problem. We'll, we'll make sure to get more questions up there. Uh, the next question that we have directly relates to something you all were asked, were talking about earlier related to um, the intersectionality of making our communities more thriving. Let's see, it says, please talk about the connections between housing density, supporting small businesses, environmental justice, and transit options. Um, reminds me of some conversations that uh, we've had with a number of you about how we build an infrastructure that makes those connections, including a strong bike and pedestrian infrastructure. Any thoughts about that? I'll take a stab at that. Again, I think it's about creating that that holistic ecosystem, right? So there's that intersectionality. Um, uh, Council Member Mosqueda, the panel that you and I are, were on, talked a lot about, you know, the the 12 minute, you know, plan, right? The city's 12 minute plan, which is, you know, within 12 minutes, you know, you can get to work, you can get to school, you can, you know, you can shop, uh, you can get to the doctor, right? You can have recreation, um, but that everything is is easily accessible. And I think that again, that that same same model does does approach and, and that that's that's what supports small business and that's what supports that that high quality of life that, that we all want for all of our neighborhoods and and all of our community when we center community and we talk about what does what does the community need um, what what does the market bear uh, we're, we're able to come up with with those really you know creative um, you know creative plans that are that are robust um, and and have a have a high quality of life that, that include all of those those needs. So I think that that's that's where where it starts. We all we all want that. And going back to, you know, how do how do we create that model? How do we create that system? How do we how do we create that plan? And then going back to some of the other previous conversations, provide that technical assistance and that support um, so that those ideas can really, you know, be, be flourished and, and stand up on their own. I'd like to just say that um, while housing density is part of the solution, um, you know, I recognize there's other kind of housing, the middle kind of housing, but uh, when it comes to high density housing, like maybe we'll get in South Park one big building, 
Um, it is about creating an affordable commercial space on the first floor. I could see there's lots of small historic businesses that have been in the area. So we invite them into the process. Environmental justice will be part of the design of how, how it, it comes to be. And the pedestrian infrastructure, you know, there is a bus, there are buses along the street. We will be demanding more bus service in the area, I'm sure in the future. But um, I'm really not quite sure how this all fits in with the comp plan, but I think it's a really beautiful vision to see all that come together. And yeah, that would be my vision, my ideal in working and uh, designing such a building. Thank you. I love it. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. Anyone else? Okay, great. Well, thank you for those um, community partner panel questions. And we do have Joseph Piha, who's been so incredible in helping to figure out the technology to have this live streamed event and to help host us today. He's with our communications team at the city of Seattle. So Joseph is gonna field a few more questions that came in, it sounds like from members of the press and uh, Joseph, um, if you wanna tee up those questions again, colleagues, feel free to um, jump in if you have an answer and we'll try and get to as many as we can. We have about 10 more minutes for this before we wrap up. Thank you, Councilmember Mosqueda. Our first question from the media comes from Andrew Engelson from the South Seattle Emerald. He asks, displacement is, is, displacement is a huge concern in the South End. The Central District has gone from being 70% Black in 1970 to 15% Black today. Similar gentrification shifts are happening now in Columbia City and coming soon to the areas near the Othello Light Rail Station and Rainier Beach. Absent big outlays of funds for affordable housing at the state and federal level, what are one or two high impact steps you believe the city should implement to prevent the displacement failure that happened in the CD from happening elsewhere in the South End as it changes zoning and increases density? Donating surplus properties, converting city owned golf courses, modifying the incentive zoning program. Joseph, do you mind dropping that question if you have it electronically into the chat as well? Um, this is the first time uh, we've all had the chance to see that question or hear it. So I wanna make sure folks have the chance to both visually see it, that always helps me. Uh, there's a lot embedded in that question. So if folks have thoughts about um, the inclusivity and the, the disparity that was um, noted in the question, we will turn it over to you. Yeah, I'll take a first stab at it. Again, we work so closely with, with businesses with uh, anti-displacement strategies, and it very much you know, starts with providing that technical assistance um, and those community navigators, right? So from the small business owner's perspective, what do they see? They get a letter from their landlord that says, you know, you need to move out. This is happening, <laughs> right? Again, you know, in the normal planning process, you know, it's that that reactionary um, approach. Um, we need to, you know, roll it back, you know, further than that, so that what the city can do um, is be more proactive. Uh, with reaching out to the technical assistance um, advisors to provide that technical assistance to the businesses that are um, at risk of displacement. So it's, it starts with first identifying, you know, who are those businesses that are at risk? How are we providing them with the technical assistance um, so that we can guard against displacement? And then, yes, creating those programs, creating those mechanisms um, that we can then, uh, if we have to, relocate that business to somewhere else still within the community, within that footprint of the community, um, you know, or, you know, find another way to guard against that, that displacement. And so I would say that the first absolute shift is, um, you know, it's the crisis management because, because it is a crisis uh, to guard against the displacement and the gentrification that's happening within our communities. Um, and that first line of, of defense is, is having that, that information and, and arming that technical assistance advisor, you know, to provide that direct assistance uh, to the, the property owner um, or to the business so that they, they know what their options are um, and having a suite of options and services available because it's not a cookie cutter. Um, every business is unique and different and we'll have to have uh, unique solutions um, to truly, you know, guard against, against displacement. Um, just, just, just 
taking the question as a, a, as an emergency question, I, I think the first thing I would love to, the city to do would be just to issue guarantees through a bunch of entre entrepreneurs without mo without moving cash. We know property in Seattle isn't going to go down in, in value, so there's no risk of, of actual capital loss at, at the city. Just an example. Um, I started going. I start going to the banks and saying, "Hey, I know I, I might get an an SF an SIF uh, grant for five million. I'd like to leverage that by twenty million, and um, I would like you to issue me a five million dollar line of credit." And they go, "Interesting. Uh, exactly how's that going to work? What's the collateral? Well, but it's the house we buy. Well, no, it's a line of credit, Curtis. So that means you have to have collateral before that. I go, well, that's ridiculous. I've done so many loans with you without me having the collateral. No, no, that's permanent financing, Curtis. You want a line of credit. And so we went on and on that conversation a little bit longer. I'm trying to talk in their, in the, in their language. Finally, they say to me, well, maybe we don't take the money out of our commercial money. Maybe we take it out of our BIPOC money. And I go, oh, there's BIPOC money. I didn't know you had a special BIPOC fund. It'd be, it'd be nice to, and, and to know that. So the real issue is it's not that the banks don't want to make loans. They actually are not smart enough to know how to make loans. We have to understand that they, they don't know how to make loans in our, in, in, our, in our communities. And that really became apparent in the last couple of weeks. So if we can have the city and other entities do guarantees where we could say, lend us the money, it's guaranteed over here on Seattle property. I think we can acquire, I mean, literally hundreds of millions of dollars of property with just us understanding that people don't even understand the problem. Our bankers do not know what this problem is. They, they are so used to just making loans that are safe loans for their people that they don't know how to think differently. We need to help them think differently and the city needs to think differently and we need to think differently on, on, how, to, on how to fix this. Excellent. And Ab, you put a great resource in the chat. Did you wanna to speak to that? Yes, uh, we had recently released our uh, community policy brief uh, on disaster gentrification and some of the uh, recommendations that we had there included creating opportunity for BIPOC communities to secure land and buildings to preserve affordability by robustly funding acquisition and preservation funds. Um, you know, we need to preserve existing housing and commercial property that are serving low income and BIPOC communities. And we need to continue uh, investing in community driven and equitable development policies um, and exploring enabling policies like tenant opportunity to purchase that prioritizes uh, communities to uh, have determination um, on their housing conditions. Well, thank you all for that. And um, I know we have a few more questions from members of the press, but it gets me really excited about where the city should change its lending policies as well. So we can lead by example um, and we'd love to talk with you more about that. Joseph, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Council Member Mosqueda. Our next question from the press comes from Erica Barnett from Publicola. Are policies like right to return and affirmative marketing to people with ties to a neighborhood the right response to the challenges of gentrification? And do they go far enough? What are some other policy changes you would like to see to help people who are economically displaced from a neighborhood return to that neighborhood? And just to sort of break it down a little bit, because I know that in housing and in zoning language, we often use terms and, and acronyms and assume folks know. Um, the affirmative marketing and community preference really is this term where when we build housing, we will affirmatively market to the folks who were there previously and at highest risk of displacement. When we do community preference, we say we're gonna build this building with the preference for X community who has been displaced from this specific community and then really try to have them come in first. This is a way for us to try to um, make sure that we're addressing displacement and then also work within the confines of state law. Um, but just to break that down in case anybody wants to jump in on that question. I, I wasn't sure. sure. Oh, go ahead, you, you go ahead, you go first, Maria, and then I'll go after you. I wasn't sure how much fair housing, you know, how much we can do more given fair housing laws. Um, I mean, sure, we could, uh, 
you know, I, I look at how we've worked with homelessness and have created this triage project where some group decides who goes where when they're homeless. I don't think I want to see that much involvement in, in uh, how we decide, like, let's say we decided, let's make sure everyone who's disabled has housing. So do we get more affirmative and say these units that are developed go to people who are developmentally disabled? We sort of do that with special populations funding when we have for homeless or the veterans. I'm not sure. I, I'd love to hear if there's other ideas beyond this. I'd love to see this because I think the policy is there, but I, I don't think we've seen it that much. So I think just unfolding this and experimenting, having community work with developers, Let's see how far we can get with it. I, I'm not sure. Andrea, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Thanks, Maria. I appreciate that. Yeah, again, I think that it's it's we're we're missing that middle piece, right? Um, so we have the the initial, the outreach, the facing displacement piece, and then we have the policies to try to get people back. But where do they go in the in the in the interim, right? And so I think that. If our policies like, um, you know, getting getting people to come back or, you know, write a first refusal or, or whatever the zoning, the zoning language truly is, you know, to, to, to work, we, we have to have a plan for what happens during that, you know, three year process, you know, while we're we're developing and, and, and we're building. And so that does lend itself more to, you know, again, some of like Curtis's ideas of having these these cohorts of, you know, more, you know, collaborative, um, you know, work that, that can happen to ensure that during that interim, there, there is there is a space, there is that there is a support because honestly, right, it's hard. It's hard once you build the new space, no matter how much money you put into affirmative marketing, you know, to get people to invest in a transition and then come back, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's really difficult to see that work. So I would like to see more thought and focus and emphasis put into what happens in that transition time, then I think we can be more, more effective with um, you know, having people return to, to neighborhoods that they've been temporarily displaced from them. I just like to throw a, a practical idea. I would really like to see someone like the tenants union actually have a database of, of people of color that are living in the neighborhood. So, um, so if properties come up, um, and, and it's some, some type of responsibility where there's this database that even as a marketer of, of affordable housing, that that's a first place that we could go to. So it's not just marketing. We actually have a place to go to. So I don't, that, there's just one that's been really thinking about how we could use the tenants un, union in a more, in a, as a landlord, as a non-adversarial role, but actually as a positive role where our tenants are actually mem members of a union. <laughs> and, 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 and is there a way to keep us out of the courts? and keep us out of all these issues that come up. I think the, the tenants union or something like the tenants union, and union as its name could, could really play a, a huge role in that. I love all these ideas, Ab, I don't wanna cut you off, but um, unless you wanna jump in, we could try to squeeze in one more question, maybe with one answer and then we'll wrap on time. Does that sound right? Maybe I'll just like do a short, I think we really <laughs> need to put you know, investment in capital, technical assistance, and capacity building throughout our comprehensive planning process. Like they can't, communities can't just be part on one piece of it. They have to be within the entire process um, and really focusing on, uh, we talk about these great ideas that other places are doing. We need to like put our money into uh, incubating these things. Um, we have enabling legislations. We need to pair that up with actual um, dollar investments. That is so true. Okay, Joseph, do you want to throw out that last question, see if we have a quick answer, or Councilmember Morales, how are we doing on time? Uh, I think we have time for one more and a quick answer, and then we can we can wrap it up. Great. We have. One more question from Doug Trump from The Urbanist. Doug asks, how can the city better leverage high opportunity areas where residents are at low risk of displacement? 
places like Laurel First or Mount Lake that haven't been asked to accommodate much new housing in the past few decades. The only thing I could think of when I was thinking about this earlier, I thought the same thing, was is there a public land there that is potential for community ownership and development of affordable housing? I see that one, that's the only way I see in. Uh, so that was my only idea that came up to mind. Thank you so much. That's a great idea to look into. Any additional comments on that? Okay. I just wanna say thank you to the folks who wrote in with questions, both from members of the media and the press. And uh, Councilman Morales, I will just uh, say a few closing comments and turn it to you to wrap us up. That sounds good. Uh, I wanna thank our panelists here today. I've been getting messages as we have been online streaming from community partners who've been watching saying thank you for hosting this. This has um, been informative and also inspiring. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea Ray from Southeast Chamber, Maria Ramirez from Duwamish Valley Affordable Housing, Ab Johnner from Puget Sound Sage and Curtis Brown from South and community development. I wanna thank as well, Aaron House from my office who has really been uh, instrumental in helping set this up along with Devin from Councilmember Morales' office. And I wanna thank Joseph Piha for um, the work that they did to manage the technology aspects of this forum. And you heard him on the line as well. Uh, thanks to Fadi Bay for watching our timer as well. And uh, we really got a list of great policy ideas. We started talking about um, policy strategies to set us up for this comprehensive plan, building off of that racial equity toolkit, rooting our analysis through this racial equity lens, and really evaluating what has happened over the last 100 years and the ways in which we must confront the, the continuation of exclusionary policies in our zoning practices to this day in 2021 and address those head on but be led with the community voice that has informed those community roundtables that Ab um, had participated in and started us with the orientation that folks received. And you all then sort of began to uh, um, bloom on policy ideas from there to talk about what we must do in the interim, how we must create capacity building now, how we must free up the capital dollars to make sure that community actually has self-determination, autonomy, that we support residents by making sure that they have their own ability to house their neighbors. And so much of what you talked about regarding uh, crowdfunding and uh, uh, investing in communities that are high risk of displacement, we can do these things in addition to the changes that must be made to the comp plan. So I'm, I'm very inspired by this conversation. I wanna say thank you. And again, as we started with, this is just the beginning of the discussion of what needs to change both in the comp plan, but it's also a call to action for us to truly address the impact, the disproportionate impact of our current policies, whether it's housing, zoning and lending that have had a disproportionate impact on communities of color. And um, is if we don't address, we'll further exacerbate evictions that we anticipate may rise, homelessness that we're continuing to see and displacement and climate impacts. So the call for action is now, the urgency is here. And with your leadership, I look forward to um, addressing these issues head on and also creating that longer term roadmap to a more equitable housing and zoning um, future for Seattle. I'll turn it over to Councilman Morales. Thank you so much. Um, I really want to thank all of our panelists today. You've offered um, a long list of policy ideas, um, whether it's you know supporting more more cohorts, requiring community ownership in public projects, um, you know a crowdfunding portal, making sure that we're looking at state law changes that are required in order for us to be able to implement some of the things that we're talking about. Um, so this is all great and really exciting that. Um, we've brought all of your creative ideas and energy and, and rich conversation into this conversation about comprehensive planning. And as Ab noted at the very end, you know, in order for us to keep hearing from community about the kinds of things they're thinking about, we also have to build and invest in communities' ability to participate. Uh, you know, not just standard community engagement, but making sure we're um, providing translation services, meeting people where they are, ensuring that um, the community-based organizations that have real connections to community 
um, have the resources and the information they need in order to build capacity for our neighbors to be able to engage in this way, um, in this conversation in a really authentic way. So um, look forward to continuing this conversation and bringing your good ideas into this discussion. Um, as I stated earlier in the afternoon, you know, um, prosperity and the preservation of our black and brown communities must be front and center in this work. Um, racial justice, anti-displacement, anti-gentrification, um, community wealth building principles can't be ideals that we just talk about or we consider in other policy ideas. They have to be principles that we bring into our policy development from the very beginning. Um, and they have to be baked into the DNA of how we work as a, as a city council and as a city uh, in general, particularly once we get to the implementation side. Um, this is something that I'm committed to and I know is something that really guides council member Mosqueda's work as well. And that's why I'm really excited to collaborate with her and with all of you on a new strategy for housing and for more jobs and for land use so that all of these things start to move forward together uh, to make sure that our communities that have been left behind in the past, not just catch up, but are really able to thrive as we move and grow as a city. So I wanna thank everyone again for your participation. I can't stress enough how important it is that your uh, engagement and your ideas be part of the policymaking process from the very beginning. And I hope that today is really the start of a long conversation about how we organize together uh, so that we can champion this long list of policies you've suggested um, and so that we really flesh them out and develop them alongside community so that when we win these policies, it really is your win um, and we can all celebrate together. Uh, lastly, I wouldn't be a good organizer if I didn't close by asking you for one thing. Uh, this conversation has been recorded. We've heard today that collaboration and movement building are really integral to getting this work to continue moving forward. So in that spirit, I'm asking for you to share the video of this panel with your friends and family, loop in uh, folks that you know into this conversation and encourage them um, to get involved and also to reach out to us and let us know what they need in order to get involved. Um, this is how we're going to start building a movement to, to really move in a, in a way that is more just and really at the end of this process have a comprehensive plan that really is centering racial equity. So I want to thank you all again for being here. Thanks so much for spending your afternoon with us and we hope you have a good rest of the day. And please join us also next Wednesday in the Land Use Committee at 9.30 a.m. I'm going to continue Councilmember Morales' organizing call to action uh, to continue this discussion about the Racial Equity Toolkit, public hearing, and please help us talk about how language matters, inclusivity matters, and we need to be looking at a way to respond to this Racial Equity Toolkit. Thank you, Councilmember Morales, and thank you, everyone, for your participation today. Yeah. Have a great afternoon, everybody. See you later.